Get a nice. A... Welcome to the Rambling Fly Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. Just run that, it. Just run it from there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, guys, welcome back to episode three. We have a special guest with us today, uh, Jake Eanes from Georgia, who's a uh, a guide and a uh, a personal and professional friend of uh, of the podcast. But uh, really appreciate you guys logging back in. If you haven't, remember to hop over on the YouTube. Make sure you like and subscribe uh, to the Blue Line page. That's where these are getting uploaded. Um, as always, I'm your host, Adam. We also have our standard host, Brent, back as well. And uh, Hello, everyone. And uh, Jake, you want to introduce yourself and tell the tell the folks a little bit about uh, about who you are? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Adam, uh, Brent, I got to say thanks for having me on here. Um, it's it's great to be able to you know talk in this uh, media about it. But um, I, I live in North Georgia, just a stone's throw across um, from the North Carolina border. I'm an avid fly fisherman. I'm sure just like everyone is listening to this podcast, um, uh, I guide when I can, and you know like to put people on fish, whether that happens to be you know trout, bass, striper, anything that pulls is a little bit extra fun, but uh, you know. Got to pay the bill somehow with the, those trout every once in a while. <laughs> I hear it. Well, we decided to have Jake on the show this week because he and I were on the phone the other day uh, talking about some unrelated podcast things, and he brought up a current event issue uh, that's kind of going on in some of the southeastern waters um, with uh, some of the fish hatcheries. So uh, wanted to get Jake on here to just kind of talk about what's going on with these, these hatchery fish and talk a little bit about uh, delayed harvest season as that's obviously uh, upon us. And anyways, Jake, you want to kind of take it over and tell us what happened uh, and kind of where, where, where this happened at. Yeah. Can, of course. Uh, can we start with explaining what a delayed harvest is? Because I was going to just I'm go unfamiliar. right to that, Brent. Yep. Perfect. I was going to go right to that. So I was going to say, uh, you know, I know there are scattered delayed harvest uh, states and, you know, areas across the country, but I know it's not necessarily a national thing. There's plenty of places that have these great healthy fisheries year round where a delayed harvest would just be, you know, somewhat redundant. Uh, where we're stuck with um, as far as hot water, as far as, you know, angler habits and stuff like that. We have developed the, you know, the states and the regulations have developed into what uh, are called delayed harvests. Uh, and basically what it boils down to is that in Georgia, from November 1st uh, until May 14th, we are catch and release only on certain streams that are stocked very, very heavily during that time period. So the idea is that you're putting in all of these fish, you're expanding on a public resource that people can get out, can utilize, can enjoy and have a lot of fun with. But during that time period, it's um, artificial lures only. Uh, in some places it might be single hook only. It's, you know, no bait, um, catch and release only, you know, obviously. Uh, the idea therein being that you are promoting this, you know, somewhat artificially sustainable, seasonally at least, fishery. That can be very pr productive for those strings of months, but at the end of those months, so whether that's May 15th here in Georgia or whether that's, I think, June 4th or June 3rd this coming year in North Carolina, that's when harvest opens up and those streams, rivers revert back into, you know, normal general trout regulation. So again, basically, long story short, it is a sustainable, fun catch and release fishery for much of the year. And then possibly as the water warms up and makes that less sustainable for the fish to actually thrive in, then that fishery turns into, you know, maybe even a put and take or maybe just a, a seasonal trout stream, whatever it happens to be. Nice. So they, they do that because the water gets so warm in the summer that the fish probably aren't going to make it anyway. So you might as well yeah. catch them and take them. In a lot of the places, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we certainly here in the Southeast have, a reputation for a lot of guys who know how to pan fry a few good trout and um, it's pretty encouraged that hopefully those are going to be those stocked fish that have been put in for a couple of months and you know removed and not necessarily left for long enough to into the gene pool or something like that those are fish that were you know put into play 
for sport. And then they served their purpose over a series of months and, you know, people got to play with them. People got to see them, you know, it's a great way to introduce kids and, you know, non-anglers to the sport. Uh, but then when those waters do happen to warm or, you know, as the season just happens to morph, then it turns into a bit more of a, a responsible and more ethical take fishery where you can feel reasonable about keeping a few of those fish. Right on. A little different than, sense. Uh, than where I'm from. Yeah. No yeah. I was going to say, yeah, I was going to say, I, I thought this might be a new concept to Brent. I don't know how much time you spent uh, trout fishing in the Southeast at all, but uh, that, uh, I, not very many of the tailwaters that I fish uh, were ever DH, but have fi certainly fished a couple DH sections uh, in my day. But um, yeah, it was really kind of a more of a localized uh, scenario for for sure. A lot in the southeast, and I'm not even sure if there's really much out of the southeast. I think if you go up the uh, eastern seaboard, I think as far as kind of uh, east coast, I think as far up as even Pennsylvania. But yeah, I, it's certainly known in the southeast that's sure one of our things here for better or worse well loved your definition of it for sure um but so so we've got some there's a couple issues in your area that are that are potentially mm -hmm. going to be impacting these dh uh sections if i'm not mistaken you want to kind of mm -hmm. roll into a little bit about what's going on yeah absolutely so with the delicate balance you have here in the southeast between uh, you know, fisheries management, you know, how, how do you find that equilibrium between making the people who want to, you know, catch a few fish and harvest them? How do you find that balance between, you know, those folks and the people who, you know, want to maintain these catch and release fisheries, the people who want more wild trout, you know, more genetically diverse populations of fish that have lived there for, you know, multiple generations? How do you find that balance? And the hatcheries fall under a lot of pressure because as we talked about with the delayed harvest with the increased temperatures um during the summer it it can result in a lot of strain on our fisheries we have you know some major population centers like atlanta like a lot of these um other north carolina georgia alabama tennessee cities so with all these anglers coming into play the states are forced to find that point where putting these fish in is the appropriate thing to do. You're not overloading a fishery that may have already existed with wild fish, but you're making sure that there's, you know, support for the local economy, for the local guides, for, you know, people coming into town to actually, you know, pursue these fish. Uh, so for instance, Georgia has five delayed harvest streams. Uh, Georgia stocks and many other streams besides just these five, you know, it's, you know, several score of streams, you know, uh, but these five delayed harvest streams are the only ones primarily that are stocked between November 1st and mid-May. Uh, those streams receive a disproportionate amount of the fish stocked by Georgia throughout the year. So of the 700,000 to a million fish that I think Georgia announced that they were going to stock in 2021, most of those fish, especially in that season, are going into the delayed harvest rivers. Um with issues coming up in Georgia's three hatcheries and with issues coming up in some of North Carolina's hatcheries for a variety of reasons, um, the state and some of the federal services that are involved have had to do a little bit of scrambling. So Georgia has been working on a two year um, rehabilitation project for one of the larger hatcheries here, the Lake Burton trout hatchery. That's finally been completed, but it's, it's slowed down that hatchery's production for the last couple of years. We're just rounding the corner on that. And of course we have two issues surface in that hatchery and a hatchery on the other side of the state, both in North Georgia, North um, East and Northwest respectively. But the Burton and um, Somerville hatcheries have both had outbreaks, contained outbreaks, thankfully, but outbreaks of whirling disease, as well as a couple of other diseases that have affected those trout. So, Long story short, and, you know, the biology can certainly get, you know, above my head, but to us fishermen and guides, we've been concerned about how many fish we're going to actually be able to get introduced into the streams this year. Um, Georgia has, it seems like, contained those outbreaks of the whirling diseases in those, of whirling disease in those two hatcheries, um, basically through shutting down the hatchery program for a, a span of days and 
until they isolated where they think they had come from, you know, cleaning that stock out, making sure those tanks were sanitized thoroughly. So it looks like those North Carolina, I'm sorry, those Georgia hatcheries have, you know, come around the bend and are back to healthy, sustaining, you know, levels again. Uh, but what that's resulted in for Georgia is that one of the five delayed harvest streams and arguably one of the more well-known ones uh, on the Chattahoochee River outside of uh, Metro Atlanta, uh, that's not going to be operated as a delayed harvest stream this year uh, due to, you know, issues with the hatcheries, some issues with the dam and with some of their, uh, you know, water quality problems as well. But one of those delayed harvest streams, and again, one of the most popular, and it has been shut down in Georgia due to, you know, issues that are being encountered in the trout fisheries around here at the moment. Sure. Maybe for the rest of the folks out here too, I, I've spent a few days on that, on that river, not a, not a ton and not as mid, admittedly as much as I probably should have when I was living in the Southeast. But um, that's probably, I mean, that's a huge deal for what you just said there, because that is a, uh, that's really the closest place to Atlanta, right? If, if I'm not mistaken to, to trout fish, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, and I mean, Atlanta is obviously just a massive center no, population center for everyone, uh, quite a few outdoorsmen, anyone that lives in that massive metropolitan area that wants to fish the, cl that is the closest fishery to them would be this delayed harvest section that Jake's talking about is now, uh, not going to be operating this year. So, um, so what do you mean by not operating? Is that they're not going to stock any fish or you just, they're not going to have the actual part of the season where you can harvest fish? Well, so they, that's a great question, Brett. They've changed the regulations for the delayed harvest on the Chattahoochee in that specific, you know, I think it's like 1.2 mile stretch right outside of Metro Atlanta. Uh, so what it amounts to is that the state and um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who also, I believe, helps stock that section, won't be operating that segment of the river under delayed harvest regulations this year. So it won't receive as many fish. Uh, those fish can, I believe, be caught and harvested under, you know, typical Georgia, you know, trout regulations. And, um, you know, we're... I guess waiting to kind of see how that might affect the fisheries. Um, you know, if it just happens to be a one year thing, I, I don't think it would, you know, possibly greatly impact pressure on the river, but it, it's certainly a draw to the area that that section's known for, you know, waiting and having, you know, at times decent hatches and a, quite a few fish. So it's a convenient place for people to get off work and go catch fish. And it's a convenient place to, you know, take kids from, you know, the city who haven't, necessarily got the time the ability to get up into the mountains into the really remote stuff but it's a it's a good nearby resource that they're able to access so they're still going to be stocking on the river georgia does publish a stocking report every couple of weeks um and i've seen that it's been stocked a few times lately but uh it's just not receiving the same number of fish that it would on a typical year and i think maybe too for some of the folks that don't know about delayed harvest sections i guess why uh why they're important uh, resources a little bit more in the Southeast too would be, um, you know, whether <clears throat> I'm sure there's a whole conversation to be had, whether you like this or not or whatever, but um, it's a great way to get introductory level people into fishing with these delayed harvest sections. I'm not saying that, I mean, fishing's tough, fishing's fishing. It's not catching. It's not automatic, but I would say these delayed harvest sections, you have, a huge amount of fish in a very small amount of water mm -hmm. um, from what yeah. I've seen in the past, from where I, when I have been there, um, it, I mean, nearly every drift, a fish should see your fly. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> um, I guess that's, that's one of the, one of the reasons is, you know, it's a, it's a, I, it, again, whether you love it or hate it, it is something that uh, if you are in the Southeast, it, you know, we don't have a ton of trout fishing around. You don't have a ton of uh, availability to go trout fish. You don't have 20,000 rivers that you could pick from. Like if you live, you know, out in Utah or Colorado or Idaho to get fish. Um, in this DH area, because they stock this area so heavily with fish, it makes it so it is very easy to catch 
trout in these areas. Um, it's definitely something that I know, uh, I know people, especially when I used to work in a fly shop, things like that, people would say uh, like the opening dates for these DH sessions would be marked on people's calendars because I mean, then people like Jake was saying would travel from different States around to go to these areas to fish these DH, uh, sections because it was, in my opinion, all terms of the word easy, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, just because you know that you're going to catch fish. Yeah. And Adam, I, I think you're, you're really on it there. It's, it's strategic management, you know, put on by the state and the, the federal services that are involved. And it's basically how can we best utilize resource that, you know, maybe we have to, you know, add to it. Maybe we have to put in, you know, fish to make this resource better, but how can we create something that, you know, drives local economy that, you know, brings in fishermen from out of state, you know, a, you know, a ton of people in this North Georgia region, Western North Carolina, a ton of these people are, you know, coming up from, you know, whether the city or whether it's down in, you know, Florida, Alabama, something like that, coming up here for vacation. What do they want to do? You know, they've, they've seen the the pictures, they've seen some videos that they, they want to go trout fishing. That's what you do in the mountains, right? So yep. how can they manage it best in their minds? It's, it's to, to run these delayed harvest streams. And it, frankly, I think it, it, you know, pays dividends for a lot of people. <clears throat> Sure. I think another thing that maybe we should, uh, another point to touch on, uh, that a little deeper that we've already mentioned is that, um, you know, if you're watching this from Colorado or Idaho or somewhere out West is probably might blow your mind, but it just kind of is what it is in the Southeast. There are a lot of people who purchase those fishing licenses who plan to keep the fish that they are going to catch. Um, so, you know, some of these resources of, of you know, stocking trout, uh, having trout in the southeast and some of these rivers literally could not exist without uh, the regulations where you are allowed to keep some fish. And most of the places I fish, you are there, you are allowed to keep a certain number of fish throughout the entire year. Um, just because there are enough people, there are enough people purchasing fishing licenses who expect to be able to come keep these fish. It's not just a sport fish that you is a yeah. catch and release like most fly fishermen, uh, we would say would do. Um, so I know, I'm, I know if you're listening to this from somewhere else out of the, out of the Southeast, maybe you haven't been to the Southeast. Um, it's definitely a very different culture. And, you know, if you're listening to Jake talk about some of these things, like, you know, <laughs> why the states are so interested in this it's because uh it is uh, that is where a lot of this money comes from from out-of-state fishermen coming yeah. to a north carolina stream or a georgia stream a lot of places where that's the nearest place that you could possibly go catch a trout mm -hmm. and uh these guys are buying fishing licenses obviously putting that money back in so uh loving or not not going into that i'm sure that's a whole nother podcast in itself as well but you do have to be able to uh, take into account your fly fishermen and your, uh, you know, the folks who maybe even are fly fishing, but you know, the catch and release anglers and the anglers who expect to keep, you know, a limit if they can every day that they go. So there's definitely a pretty hard balance that those guys have to, uh, play between at a state and a federal level, I think. Yeah. In, in many ways, I think it works out really well. Sorry, Brent, but I, I think it works out super well because you get a lot of anglers who, you know, they're here for the, the easy fish. You know, maybe they fish once a year, every couple, couple of, uh, you know, months, maybe when they're just coming up here to visit or something like that. But you have this great balance where you have a place where they can go. You have a place where they can catch fish, especially in that delayed harvest season. You know, at the end of that season, you know, have a place where people can harvest fish. But it also almost somewhat serves as a refuge for a lot of those wild trout fisheries that, you know, anglers like us and a lot of your listeners probably are, are very interested in going that little extra mile, working a little bit harder, you know, getting a little farther back in the backcountry in order to catch that wild fish that is, you know, never seen pellets or something like that. Right. Right. So right. There's a lot to say for that. Absolutely. I do want to dip my toes in just a little. I know you don't want to get in the weeds on it. What's the... Uh... What's the general consensus down there? Do people support and, and like the stocking or is it kind of like people want it to be wild rivers, wild fish only? You know, uh, Brent, I, I, I would love to say it was simple enough to just say like, Hey, we would, we would love to just have only, you know, wild fish everywhere. Uh, you know, 
we'd love to just have the wild rainbows and browns and these you know larger tailwaters and free stones and would love to have the native brookies up high in elevation but unfortunately i think we're just at a point where the culture is so firmly and thoroughly developed around the concept of you know for many people a harvest um that it's probably impossible at this point to remove hatcheries and you know supported fisheries from the game plan in western north carolina you know eastern tennessee north georgia it, it's just kind of is what it is and um yeah. that, that delayed harvest is that balance between you know streams that have a lot of these holdover fish and you know even still a, a decent bit of at times uh you know wild populations of trout but it's it's that balance point between you know a put and take fishery which you know show up catch your fish put them on a string or go home and those wild fisheries it's it's that middle ground where it's it's a good way to manage that resource for the best number of people for the most amount of time the fishermen who want to come who want to catch who want to release and then those other anglers who want to you know take home a creel limit or something like that especially yeah considering at times when the those rivers do overheat and it's too hot for the trout anyway those those fish aren't going to survive so it, it makes sense at that point to you know harvest those few fish sweet so it sounds like it's mostly mostly accepted whether it's because they want to accept it or because they have to yeah i i think it uh it really is mostly accepted and um you know the the states do all manage their DHs differently down here, but, uh, you know, Georgia has five. I'm not sure how many Tennessee has. North Carolina has, um, man, I think in my last count, I think it was 34. And uh, North Carolina's got, you know, several more hatcheries than Georgia. They've got, you know, you know, prolific cold water everywhere coming out of the Smokies and all those, uh, you know, high altitude, you know, springs. Um, but North Carolina does an excellent job managing all of these different um, angler priorities. They've got uh, very well posted streams that uh, are wild, you know, hatchery supported, delayed harvest, whatever it may happen to be. Um, but with their multi-use view of the resource, they've done a really nice job conserving and protecting a lot of their wild fisheries, but also playing into the whole game of people are here, people want to catch fish, people might want to have them for dinner. How can we make that work without sacrificing something else? Yep. And it's the money. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It, Adam, you brought it up earlier, but I think a hundred percent of the proceeds from the trout stamp in Georgia that you have to purchase in order to, you know, catch fish in public yep. water. I think a hundred percent of those proceeds go directly into the hatcheries into and water. The, making and that probably is else. a, that probably is a wild notion for folks. A lot of folks listen to this too, is that there is, there are two different licenses that you have to have in some of these States. There is a license for f warm water fishing, which you could go catch bass and carp mm -hmm. and crappie and you know, all, all, all the other interesting fish. And then there is an extra uh, license that you have to purchase to be able to trout fish. And uh, as Jacob just said, is re referred to as a trout stamp. Um, so it is pretty interesting that they'll collect a little bit extra money if you are utilizing those fisheries and trout fishing. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I, um, I did just mention uh, the North Carolina fisheries. I, I should also say that uh, with a couple of the, the hurricanes and those tropical storms that have come through in this past season, um, I think Fred particularly – knocked out several hatcheries and massively affected and disrupted the supply chain up there as far as fish production goes. Um, so one of the local hatcheries in North Carolina, I believe, lost um, between 67 and 70 percent of its fish, which actually forced wow. North Carolina to start scrambling at that point, too, to start figuring out where they could source more of their fish from. Um, what ended up happening was that some of the federal hatcheries in the region contributed fish as well as some of the other state's hatcheries, as well as even private trout farms in the area. North Carolina had to make a few deals with private trout farms in order to source some fish. Uh, but because of that, they believe um, approximately the same amount of poundage is going to be going into most of the streams. Although I, I have heard that it is less than uh, would certainly have been stocked on a typical year. 
So any any closures or anything like that going on in North Carolina, like you know, with we're not, I guess, not necessarily you know, fishing or stream closures, but you know, how uh, you know the delayed harvest is affecting the Chattahoochee area this time. Is anything like that going on in North Carolina that you know of? No closures I was aware of. That uh, what what I heard about more so was uh, was like mitigation stuff. So working with those other hatcheries. Um, Boots on the ground, the thing I've noticed mostly is that North Carolina usually has a very robust stocking population of rainbows, browns, and brookies, whereas Georgia's is typically almost all rainbows. Um, right. All of the delayed harvest streams I've been frequenting in North Carolina over the last couple of uh, months have had a, a dearth of brown trout particularly. So you're catching large numbers of rainbows, you're catching plenty of stocked brook trout, you're not seeing the same number of brown trout that you would have seen in a previous season. Interesting. Yeah. Well, cool. That's a that's a really good breakdown, and I know I learned something. Do you have do you do you guys have anything else on the on the hatcheries, or do you want to move on to the next topic? I'm good to move on if you are, Jake. Sweet. I think think you gave us some probably some pretty pretty good intel, and hopefully some uh, interesting uh, perspectives. If you are not familiar with uh, the southeast and fishing in the southeast. Uh, mm -hmm that you kind of just some things you got to deal with if, uh, if you decide to fish there. Yeah. We, we have some awesome fisheries. We have some really unique stuff, but, uh, you know, the, the States have so many interesting, unique fisheries that it, it's, it's hard to know what they're all like until you get out there and try to experience them all for yourself. So for sure. Interesting stuff. Nice. All <laughs> right. Well, I guess, you know, even though it might not, feel like winter in Colorado well, it's starting to turn into winter um, it's supposed to be winter across the country so we decided we're gonna we're gonna talk about some winter fishing techniques maybe some tips that you guys have um, you know you think winter fishing you think smaller tippet smaller flies um, but Adam why don't you start us off I mean that's right up your alley with the uh, with your own nymphing and and your yeah <laughs> Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, I don't use anything more than size, you know, seven, eight X. I actually source some specific 10 and 12 X from overseas that I can use, uh, just cause it's so thin. I'm just kidding. I don't do that. Um, so it, for the winter, some of the things I, you know, I, I think the biggest thing for me is that bug life is not as big of a factor. Um, but that on the flip side, normally to me, that would mean, you know, switch over to streamers if they're not, you know, if there's not a m lot of bug life, but, uh, sometimes too, especially if it's, uh, if it's real cold out West, I don't think it necessarily ever gets that cold back East, but, uh, or in the Southeast, but, uh, you know, the fish may kind of just be sitting low, not, not really interested in chasing a big, you know, four to six inch streamer. Um, Generally in the winter, I fish a lot like you and I did the other day up at American Falls. I use some uh, really, uh, generally some bigger flies, uh, definitely try to go for like an attractor nymph instead of a specific, matching a specific hatch, like a caddis or a, you know, a mayfly or something like that. Just a good all around nymph, like a pheasant tail uh, can, that can imitate a lot of different flies or, uh, you know, uh, like the girdle bugs. I know that is kind of specifically a, a stonefly, but I think again, that was a little more of an attractor that just is a great fly that fish just eat. Doesn't really matter what, if there's a lot of stoneflies out or not, I feel like that fly just gets eaten. Um, so I know we've kind of all got our, our go-tos, but generally I like to nymph just low and slow, uh, in the winter. And it certainly can be a great time to fish, um, uh, yo, fish are hungry. There's not a ton of other bug life. They're not seeing a bunch of other stuff out on the water. They don't have a ton of options to eat. When you run that, that nymph rig through their hole, the chances of them eating it, I feel like might even be higher. Sounds a lot like Euro nymphing to me. <laughs> hey, I, I don't know. I don't know about that. <laughs> They're underwater streamers that you dead drift that are just smaller. Um, I don't, I, <laughs> Back to dead drifting streamers. Here we go. I don't know. <laughs> Jake, do you, uh, do you want to tell us for those of us out West, what, uh, what winter looks like for fishing in the Southeast? 
Yeah. Well, our, our winter is uh, comparatively, you know, mild compared to everything else that, you know, much of the rest of the country experiences. So, uh, you know, just even on the, the stream yesterday that we were fishing, we had a fantastic hatch of um, uh, blue winged olives coming off. And, you know, that's a, it's a, it was a great hatch. They were, you know, just popping out of the riffles and we had plenty of big fish coming up to eat them. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, hard to yeah, count. Uh, on a, why don't you rub that in for us a little more? It was nice. Yeah, I think we touched 60, <laughs> uh, 62 degrees. It was beautiful. But, um, you know, we can't rely too much on any uh, consistent hatches out here in the, the winter. But uh, we do still have, you know, plenty of midge action and stuff like that on the tailwaters that we can get, you know, dry fly action almost year round on. If you're, uh, you know, playing, paying attention, you know, fishing some of those, you know, smaller backwaters off of these bigger rivers below the dams. Um, you know, our rivers aren't going to hit these, you know, crazy low temperatures that they are out West and up in the Northeast. So fish are active fish like moving around in our area. Um, many people refer to the winter down here as streamer season. So they get below these dams. They'll go out on these big floats. They're throwing their sever seven weights, their sinking lines and their articulated meat that Adam might know something about. And, uh, you know, it can result in some really nice catches. There's this new streamer I heard about called the what the Pert Pertigan, Brit the probably. Pertigan, yeah, it's either a Pertigan, per, Pertigan. or Duracell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Frenchy. yeah. I just heard of that new streamer. That's pretty mm -hmm. cool. <laughs> um, yeah, de definitely. Kind of from my experience, like Jake said, I, in the southeast, it doesn't get too cold to fish. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know that that's what we used to do in the Southeast. You know, it's, we don't smallmouth fish much, but as soon as the smallmouth kind of migrate back to the lakes, I, I, that's when I start trout fishing a lot more and hitting some of these sections with big streamers, sink tips, seven weights. And or you obviously like, you know, Jake said, you can catch them other means too, but uh, they're definitely hungry to eat streamers. I like it. Um, I guess where I'm from, you know, I grew up fishing, Deckers, uh, it's a it's a tailwater that's pretty high elevation, so it's even throughout summer it generally stays pretty cool. Uh, you're already fishing five six x, and you know most mm. of the year fish are going to eat a size 20, 22 fly. But Ew. as you get into winter, um, si sizing down your nymphs even becomes more important. Uh, Small smaller than twenty two. Yeah, yeah. No. I mean. There's a lot of guys fishing 24s and maybe 26s. Yeah, Adam's out. We won't take you there, Adam. Yeah, uh, I'm <laughs> but, out on that. I'm sorry. But it's kind of funny. Like, that's where I learned to fish. So now fishing bigger freestone rivers, even in the winter, I get to fish a size 18 or a 20 fly and, and 5X. And that seems like a treat to me as long as the river's not frozen. So, uh but, you know, I also have success on those full sinking lines, generally go with a smaller streamer and a much, much slower retrieve. So, yeah, uh, yeah, Def <clears throat> definitely see the cold uh, out west for sure. The colder water, you know, sl slows down the metabolism and you just don't have them chasing those big streamers. But certainly streamers on a slower retrieve, like Brent says, I think is is really one of my go to's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, not it's that a good that way to scratch in, the itch in the winter. Yeah, yeah. Not that that wouldn't work in the southeast. I mean, that that same technique would obviously work work in the southeast as well. Once we start hitting those consistent freezing temperatures and uh, start thinking about 6, 7X and, you know, it's size 20 and 22 midges, I really start flipping and uh, thinking about uh, striper fishing on some of our reservoirs, walleye fishing when they're migrating up uh, river to spawn, so... Trout might lose a little of their luster when it's getting really cold here for me, but uh, there's still certainly yeah. some nice fish that can uh, be caught. That's probably one of the best things about the Southeast is there's still something to do, whether it's mm -hmm. trout, you know, even if your smallmouth fishing kind of dies off, some of the other, the other types of fishing can, can start coming up if the trout goes away. So that's something uh, I'm actually a bit curious about. If we have a minute or two to talk, um, what, what is the striper deal up there? Are you, are you finding them near the surface on reservoirs? Or are you chasing them more than just busting bait? Uh, you know, there's a couple of different scenes for striper in the region. Um, find them on top. That's very productive. We have a couple of, you know, really famous guides here on some of our larger reservoirs in uh, North Georgia and the Southeast area. 
Uh, but they're they're famous for you know going out there there on their uh, you know center consoles and stuff, using electronics, locating fish um, uh, that might be you know a little bit less obvious on the surface. But uh, if if you time it right, you can find acres of busting fish like you might at Cape Cod or off the Jersey Coast or something in the right times of year. Um, that's a heck of a lot of fun, obviously. Uh, fishing form at night can be very productive. There's um, you know a number of reservoirs here in North Georgia that um, people will use submerged lights that we just refer to as dock lights, just like they would in, you know, Miami, South Florida that, that attract, you know, snook and pompano and everything else. Well, up here, they're, they're pulling out, you know, spotted bass, they're putting hybrids, and they're putting these big striped bass out on these dock lights. So you can go out there, and as soon as the uh, ambient light falls low enough, the fish start congregating under these docks. There's enough light there to keep the bait fish there. And you can show up there and catch 50 to a hundred pounds of striper on a, a half decent night. And it's just a ton of fun. It's all very visual sight fishing and uh, just no, couldn't be more fun. Are you using a lot of like 22s and 24 inch, you know, or 20, 22s and 24, you know, size midges or seven, six, seven X for those or. For, for uh, perspective's sake, uh, most people's favorite live bait for these dock lights happens to be eight to nine inch stocked rainbow trout. So if you uh, <laughs> somehow <laughs> manage to find the, the right bait bucket that's got a few eight, nine inch rainbow trout, yeah, maybe throw in a size 22 or maybe throw in some Griffith's gnats or something and see what they pick up. But uh, <laughs> throw them in the live the bait boat. alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, <laughs> that's just what you use to keep your bait bucket. Pretty much. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Yeah. That's cool. I, I honestly, I really do think that the Southeast is a under really underplayed and, uh, you know, uh, overlooked fishery for, for fly fishermen, but. Well, in, in many ways, I mean, you know, the, the Kona saga and the Coosa and a couple of the other rivers in this region are, uh, you know, incredibly biodiverse, uh, just have enormous numbers of, uh, unique species that don't occur elsewhere that are endemic to the area and only in some specific drainages. Georgia has 10 recognized species and subspecies of black bass that uh, is almost double what occurs in any other state in the country. And that's, you know, obviously beyond anything else that occurs in the world. So there's unique fisheries here that abound and, you know, many of them are tailor-made for light fly rods and even some bigger, heavier stuff. So... Can be yeah, as we fun. all know, the, the, this is a trout podcast. We're just going to keep moving on that. We don't care anything about this black bass. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Just move move on. Next this section. Is that works. Keep moving on. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, that sounds it, cool, dude. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Um, any more tips that you guys have just for it, it, any of the viewers, whether it's, you know, region specific or not? Any any other winter tips uh, that I you would, have for? Yeah, I like in the winter, you the water does clear up and your body, well, my body seems to move slower in the winter. So use that as an opportunity to slow down and look into the river more than you're just fishing. See if you can see how the fish yeah. are acting and, and maybe change up your techniques a little bit. Yeah. Good answer. Well, sounds like, sounds like the, uh, the deal is you still got to get out there and fish, even if it's, even if it's cold. I, th I think yeah, that's the, the, my takeaway is you still got to go fishing. Best advice I ever heard about, uh, you know, when, when's the best time to go fish is anytime you can, right? So, you know, whether it's the dead of winter, whether it's cold, and whether it's just uncomfortable to be out there, if, if you've got the itch, scratch it, get out there, try to catch something. There you go. Yeah, hopefully you'll learn like something it. every time you go out there. <laughs> That's right. Well, we had one other quick, uh, quick little segment we wanted to do here about uh, some questions uh, as far as guiding goes. Uh, Jacob obviously is a is a guide, as we've mentioned in uh, North Carolina and North Georgia. Uh, if you guys are interested in uh, taking a guided trip around there, meeting up with Jacob, we're going to have uh, his information linked uh, in the information on the podcast. Uh, but we had a couple questions that uh, I know I get asked a lot about guides or guiding. Um, and I know Jake gets asked a lot of different questions about his, uh, his guiding. Um, but one of the, one of the ones we just kind of wanted to flip through here and, and, and help potentially answer any questions that you guys may have about taking a guided trip. Uh, if, 
you've never been on a guided trip before, maybe teach you a little bit about what would be, uh, what's to be expected, some things like that. Um, so, so Jacob, just starting out, what, what are, what are some of the best tips, uh, that you would recommend if you've never taken a guided trip before? Uh, if you've never been on a guided trip and that's something you're interested in doing, you've already booked a guide, maybe you haven't yet, you know, practice, you know, get out in the yard, make a few casts. You know, if you don't happen to have that fly rod, you know, maybe you go to your local fly shop and, you know, talk to those guys about what kind of gear you might need to use, you know, what kind of flies you may use. You know, if, if you're going on that guided trip to figure out if fly fishing is something you're interested in, you know, call your guide, speak to him, you know, frankly, and, uh, and say, you know, Hey, what, expectations can I bring into our day together? You know, can I expect to catch fish or can I expect to, you know, catch, or, or can I maybe even expect to, you know, be casting like Brad Pitt and, uh, and everyone's favorite movie, but, um, you know, what expectations can I have with my guide? And I think that's just about the most important thing. Yeah. I, no, I asked that I, at the I beginning of that. every trip. <clears throat> I asked that at the beginning of every trip. I say, what priorities do you have? So, how can we best address that? That's one thing I was going to say that you just brought up is even as a client, talk to your guide about what your expectations Definitely. are or what you want out of the day. So the guide can tailor the, the day to <laughs> your needs. Oh, precisely that. Yeah. You know, what's interesting to me is that all of my guides and my bartenders have the exact same expectation for me. You know, like there's a cooler, a beer, like, they're carrying just you home after some the of, days over. Right. Just <laughs> hand me some of the beer out of that cooler. Like it's that, it's that simple. It, I honestly, I think anyone could be a guide. All you got to do is know how to open a beer and you're, I mean, you're set, <laughs> but no, no, that definitely having the right expectations for, you know, making sure everybody's on the same page, I think yeah. is the biggest number one thing to, mm -hmm. to having a good day for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, um, there, there's certain fisheries like you know, you, you you know talked about all you talk about all these guys down in you know Florida, the Keys, or you know out in the Salt, and you know, you might be a perfectly you know competent trout fisherman who's gone on plenty of trips before, but you can't expect that skill to you know relate to a different fishery immediately. So you know, talk right. to that guide. What can I practice before our day together? That's that's an excellent thing. Yeah, yeah, very true. If you're going to South Florida, you might not know that you need to buy your guide lunch and dinner. Exactly. Instead of them providing, <laughs> <it for> you. <laughs> we appreciate it in North Georgia too, but it's less expected. <laughs> very different. Very different guide expectations in Florida than in Absolutely. Montana. Very different. I, I, that was one that pr that did shock me pretty big, but for sure. Um, I guess we kind of touched on it. Another thing that we get just a lot is, uh, you know, is there anything to do to prep for your guided trip? I know we just met, answered, you know practice and casting but is there is there anything else you could think of jake that maybe you know that you need to do to prep like if you are maybe you've been on a guided trip before but um you know <clears throat> what could you prep with going to a going with a new guide or going to a new fishery that you've never fished before well it's a good question um let's see the, the most important piece of prep work i think you can do before you know coming fishing is uh figure out how to hold a fish so, you know, maybe, maybe you need to take your, uh, your Nalgene water bottle, you know, grease it up. I don't know, do something like that. Just figure out how to hold it. <laughs> I, I get all these clients who just cannot hold their dang fish. And of, of course I'm, I'm kidding here, but, um, <laughs> but, you know, pr practice your casting and, you know, talk to your local, uh, guys about what can be expected on the water. Talk to that guide about, um, you know, what you can expect, what you can bring to the trip. How can you, uh, you know, most ensure that you're going to have a good time and, you know, not necessarily getting your guides away, but, you know, find that right balance between, uh, you know, making sure that your guide's effective and that you're doing the best you can on the water as well. Now, when you're practicing that, what's the best grease to put on the Nalgene bottle? Do you use like a Crisco, or like a vegetable oil? Yeah, you know, I, I, I try to go with the more organic stuff. I'm using coconut oil lately, and that, that's been very <laughs> effective in my practice. Good, good. How that's big are water bottles? <laughs> does... <laughs> Do you need to go buy a specific water bottle to match the size of fish you're expecting? To you catch? you will want to approximate it. So if you know if we're going you know black bass fishing for largemouth or something like that, the standard one liter round cylindrical Nalgene will work pretty well. Oh, perfect. Uh, if, now, <laughs> now I I have been reaching out to Nalgene recently because they don't make one small enough for the fish that I generally catch Absolutely. to be able to practice with. Um, yeah, do you a have common any, issue. Do you have any advice for me? Uh, chapstick. 
you know, you take your little chapstick, <laughs> smear it with some Vaseline or something. That's probably your best okay. bet. I found Perfect. that to be also pretty uh, efficacious. <laughs> That's why you come to the Ramblin' Fly podcast right there. To get get some good some good tips like that. Again, just the info you need. This is where you come to learn. <laughs> this is o- only what you need. Nothing nothing else. <laughs> um. Well, I I get this question asked a lot. I know this is one thing that uh, even when I was guiding a lot, I didn't really necessarily think to talk about very much. But uh, what should you bring if you're going on a guided trip? Maybe maybe again with if you've never gone on a trip before, if, the, if you're coming to meet a brand a, a new a new guy that you've never gone with before, uh, what's something that maybe a couple of things you should bring? Oh, you know, your, your typical standards, you know, talk, talk to that guide. I keep harping on it, but talk to your guide about what the guide's going to provide. But, you know, you know, have your hat, have your polarized sunglasses whenever possible. That's just going to give you that extra leg up. And, you know, any little thing that can help you is beneficial, you know, a rain jacket, extra layers, something like that, something to help keep you warm if it, you know, starts to really come down on you, but you know, talk to the guide, figure out what the uh, priorities are for that day. My number one thing would be polarized sunglasses. Yeah, it's huge. Do not try to go fishing if you have not purchased a pair of polarized sunglasses. Uh, I mean, That's I cannot, uh, I mean, it's not something that I, is a guide. I would, I would think you should provide a spare set of sunglasses. I carry, especially when I was guiding, I would carry two sets of sunglasses because if I was on a guide boat, I did not want to not have a pair of sunglasses on because mm-hmm. I didn't trust you know, potentially people slinging hooks around, especially if there's two folks in the boat. Uh, but I would bring a second pair of sunglasses for myself, one for low light, one for, you know, really bright light. Um, but certainly I, I've had many times where I've met up with, met up with people and say, Oh, you know, see this rock right here in the river, see this, you know, this log, see this drop off. And they're like, well, no. And then, you know, you kind of like, oh, man, how can you, you know, okay, well, fine. We'll cast over there. We'll figure this out. And then about 10, 15 minutes later, you're like, what sunglasses do you have on? And you take, you know, you take your sunglasses off and look and you put them back on. You're like, Oh, okay. That's why you can't see anything. Cause mm-hmm. you know, you didn't bring polarized sunglasses. Um, that would be uh, to me, the number one thing, if you were going on a guided trip, have a pair of good polarized sunglasses that you're going to bring with you. Absolutely. Can't argue with that. There you go. Well, Jake on your, on your off days when you're not guiding, what, what, what do you do? Is there anything that you do, uh, you know, preparing? Is there anything that, you know, it maybe, maybe it doesn't even have to be uh, fishing related or anything like that, but what do you do on your, your guide's day off? You know, uh, I like doing my, my prep work and, you know, getting some flies tied up and just being ready for the, the, the coming days. But, um, I like the pursuit of all things ichthyid. So, you know, I, I like figuring out what the right time of year is to target a different species or use a new method and make good use of it. So, you know, if striper's going off right now, I'm, I'm going out and doing striper. And if, if I feel like the, you know, if I feel like I've neglected my brook trout streams at high altitude, you know, that's what I'll be out there doing. So I just like to keep moving and keep it interesting. Cool. Mm-hmm. I think that was our vocab word of the day. What was? It's a new section, <laughs> vocab word of the day. The vocab yeah. word of the day, I believe. We have a the- dictionary definition that comes up and also the thesaurus with other like words uh, for more of us <laughs> we, common folk we need that yeah for, for so again jacob what, you're you're a fan of all things what uh fish yeah that that's uh <laughs> i i think maybe the english uh term to use i don't i don't think fish is what you said uh ichthyist <laughs> or ichthyist there, excuse me ichthyid there we go yeah. perfect all right mm-hmm. vocab word of the day we got yeah, it. it's a fun one um and i think uh Probably all the viewers are wondering here, and because I know I am. Uh, so I, I'm looking here behind you over on your wall. We've got your, you've got some fly rods. I see we've got, you know, your tall tails, uh, you know, nice metal uh, mm-hmm. artwork. If you keep moving over, we've got a picture of a, of a fish here. Um, and then if we keep moving all the way to the left of your screen, I believe what I see what we have some tippet on the wall next to the bed. Is that correct? Uh, I'm sure it is. Some spools of tippet. Do you yep. now? Is there any reason that we keep those right next to the bed, re- readily available? Ready? I mean, is there anything that we need to use those for? You never know when you're at- going to need a sturdy knot. <laughs> you never know when you're going to get confronted by that need. Right. Okay. <laughs> is that and now is that one of your guide tips to all to keep spools of tippet next to the bed? I mean, is there a certain kind of tippet that you should keep there? I'll, Something I'll pretty strong. This. 
braided line's a disaster anywhere near a bed. So keep that <laughs> far away. Spider okay. wire, that, that's going to cut you up. It's, it's not going to help anything. Okay. Don't go with that. You want All thick right. fluorocarbon. Okay, like a th- it, okay, good. It's abrasion resistant. It's harder to see in the water. It's, it's common knowledge. It's very effective. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. No, this is this is this is good knowledge to have. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think. I mean, as far as as far as it goes, I think those are those are my those are my questions. I think uh, if, if you guys have any other other questions for guides, please let us know. Uh, We'd love to answer some more guide guide questions, guide specific questions um, about anything like this. If any of our listeners out there uh, reach out to us, DM us questions. Uh, we kind of kept this all about guides today since we had Jake on here. Uh, we've got a few other questions that we do plan to answer in some pr- uh, future episodes. But uh, if you have any questions about that you want to see answered on the on the podcast, please reach out to us. Uh, leave us a DM uh, or uh, comment on our YouTube videos. Uh, Brent, where, where are we at with uh, uh, getting the spot, the podcast on Apple? It is being evaluated. So mm, I think that well. just means we're in a holding pattern until, uh, what's his name, Tim Cook calls me, right. talks about it. Uh, once we have that discussion, a little quick interview, he will personally sign off on it, and it, it'll be good to go, top of the charts. But Spotify has already approved it, if, I, if I'm right. Okay. So if you guys are listening to this on Spotify, please, uh, please know that we are over on YouTube as well. If you want to see, uh, see live our interview, uh, with Jake and, uh, myself and Brent, you can hop over on the YouTube channel and watch that as well. Um, blue line co (coughs) I I did so good. I only coughed once. Almost finished the plugs. I know I really did. I almost did. Uh, Hop on over to the YouTube channel, uh, Blue Line Co. Uh, on YouTube, and there is a specific playlist for the Ramblin' Fly. Uh, really appreciate you guys uh, reaching out. Um, J- if you Again, if you are interested in uh, meeting up or fishing with Jake, we're going to have his information in here below us as well. Um, and Brent, I believe, has found us a good funny video if, uh, if you want to play that for us to, to close it out. Yep, just a quick little send-off. Let me pull it up here. Man, I was doing so good too. So close. Jake, can you uh, can you see the screen share? I can see it. Yep. Awesome. Well, I guess we'll just uh, we'll just send it off right now. Is it muted? Of course. <laughs> oh, <it's> so deep. <laughs> ah. oh. The burn. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> deep. Ah. <laughs> oh, I've been there. Oh, it's one of those that gets funnier every time you watch it. <laughs> I love how they said half day too. Not even, not yeah. even after oh, the yeah. full day. Yep. That's like when you stop for lunch. <sighs> yeah. Like, can we switch to nymphing for like ten minutes? <laughs> no, no. Keep no. on it. No, I'm gonna pick not up this dry boat. fly rod. Just, I just need the little three weight just for a few minutes here. Streamers or dry flies, you keep that bobber out of here. <laughs> you keep that bobber away from me, sir. Uh, I don't need that witchcraft. <laughs> excuse, yeah, excuse me, the proper terminology. That's it. That's it. <laughs> All right, cool. fellas. Well, Jake, appreciate you joining us. That was uh, informative on my end. And now I have a new word to look up. So I've, I've got homework for the week. It, I just made great. it up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Brent Adam, it was, uh, it was totally my pleasure. And uh, thanks for having me. I hope we can talk again sometime about this sort of thing. Well, thanks so much, Jake. Well, guys, thank you for all uh, tuning in. <clears throat> Man. Guys, thank you all for tuning in and uh, to the third episode of the Ramblin' Fly podcast. Uh, again, please make sure you're following us over on Instagram as well at, the, at Ramblin' Fly. And uh, reach out to us. Let us know what you want to see. Thanks so much for listening. And we're going to see you guys out on the water. Thanks so much.